Mark D'Antonio has a degree in astronomy and is the Mutual UFO Network, uh, better known as MUFONS, chief photo video analyst. He is host of the Sky Tour Radio on KGRA and the host and creator of Sky Tour Livestream with Mark D'Antonio on YouTube, where all of us can go and watch live as beautiful deep space sky objects materialize before our eyes in seconds courtesy of the Sky Tour Observatory and its research telescope. Mark is the CEO of FX Models, a model making and visual special effects company specializing in digital, physical models, and organic visual effects for the film industry. He has an extensive work history in the film and television area, uh, appearing regularly on a number of network and television shows, including NASA's Unexplained Universe, the Discovery Channel, and What on Earth on the Science Channel. He is often characterized as the voice of scientific reason, uh, yet he fully expects the alien intelligence out there may be there and possibly here. Unlike many astronomers, Mark is creating the Aerial Anomaly Detection System, formerly called UFOTOG2, with Academy Award winner Douglas Trumbull, um, which will be a remote system able to detect advanced propulsion systems to at play in our local universe. As such, the project promises to bring ufology well into the 20th century. If extraterrestrial intelligences have managed to ply the vast gulf between the stars and us, and reach us, then science should be able to tell us so. Such results will be backed up by stories which we so often hear from conference people at conferences like this, among other cases, who have encountered something strange in our skies and on the ground. Please give a big return welcome to my friend and one of my favorite lecturers, Mark D'Antonio. He said to take no prisoners. No, I'm lying. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Mark D'Antonio. He already told you that. But, you know, uh, my specialty is astronomy. That's what I got my degree in. You know, I mean, what do you do with that? Well, you don't get a job. And this is what astronomers look like. This is how we dress. But frankly, I knew I was going to be an astronomer when I was nine years old because I knew that the universe was a big place and I'd go out at night and I'd look up, Mark, what are you doing outside? I'll be in in a minute, Mom. Hours later, they're asleep. I'm still outside in a blanket looking up. The sky was always very intriguing to me. I just had, had to be part of it. I had to be in there somewhere. So I went to school for astronomy and uh, I started breaking a few molds right away because I, I don't, first of all, I don't use podiums. I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be out there with you a little while, so deal with it. <laughs> but <coughs> the fact is, um, when, I, when I got my degree, I kind of was breaking molds because I didn't feel like they were teaching me astronomy that really meant anything. They were, they were teaching me about stuff that we, we kind of saw in the books, we understood. And yes, there's a lot of book learning, a lot of physics, calculus, mathematics you have to do. But one thing was missing. That was a link to people that aren't in astronomy. How do you tell people that aren't in astronomy about planets around other stars in a way that means something? How do you discuss the potential for alien life if you don't at least admit that it's possible? And when I got my degree in astronomy in 1983, <laughs> how old? When I got my degree then, you did not talk about planets around other stars. So when I went to my head of my department, I said to him that I believed it was a populated universe. That phrase became the title of my book, The Populated Universe. And it's not out yet. But the fact is, I felt it was a populated universe. And I said that to him. And I go, look, look at us, okay? Look at everything on this planet. Look at all the life forms, the advanced life forms, anything above the multicellular level. 
they have this symmetry, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I said, that's a pattern. Something is providing this pattern. The universe is creating this, this possibility. And then life is exploiting it in a variety of ways. In fact, billions of species of ways. And, you know, I made my case, and he just looked at me over the top of his glasses. And he said, Mr. D'Antonio, get back in the observatory and leave Captain Kirk to us. Okay. 1987, when the first planet was announced and confirmed, I went back. And I went back to his office. I walked in, and I went like this. And he looked right at me, and he goes, it's only one planet. I don't want to hear it. It's only one planet. Isn't that science? No speculation allowed. Well, that's how I broke the mold. I speculate. And the reason I do is because speculation breeds hypothesis. Hypothesis breeds experimentation. Experimentation finds proof. That's what we got to do. Hello. I mean, what's so hard about that? So, you know, this, this talk is meant to talk about our... Uh, if, it, if I can figure out how to work this. Uh, this talk is, is meant to show us uh, some realities about our planet and to kind of acquaint you in a fun way with the prospects of intelligence in the universe. I think you'll, you may like it. Um, so uh, we are a little speck, of course, and as my uh, favorite scientist of all time, Carl Sagan, who remembers Carl Sagan, right? As he used to say, we are a pale blue dot. You know, and that was, that was meaningful to me as a young kid. I thought that was meaningful. And we are. You know, we're just a speck of dust. And the fact is, we ask, you know, could someone find us you know, here on this planet? Well, we're looking for other planets that have an oxygenated atmosphere like our planet. And by the way, oxygen doesn't like to be in atmospheres. I don't know if you knew that. Just because it's here, it means something's actually replenishing it. And that something here is life. Absence of life means that oxygen would get bound up in the ground and turn into other compounds. Mars, for example, had a lot of oxygen in its early atmosphere. And guess what happened? That oxygen ended up going into the iron compounds. So Mars is what color? Rusty color. Yes. Somewhere out there, a bulb went off. That's why it's red. I mean, but you may not know that, but that's okay. See, that's the whole thing. That's what astronomy is all about, is getting this information out and drawing those parallels. So we ask, could someone find us? If they're looking for an oxygenated atmosphere, then they're probably going to say, okay, biological life is probably causing this. Let's go there. And we're doing that now, you know. We're doing that now. We're actually looking for oxygenated atmospheres. You know, we're going to use the... Uh, James Webb Telescope, in a, in a, I keep saying next year, next year, I said that three years ago, but it's being delayed. But we think that maybe it happened before, because we look at all the myths and, and the mythology on this planet, we think there's probably good reason to suspect that somebody might have come here already. And the reason we suspect that is because of stories we hear. We don't have any real tangible evidence, but we have circumstantial evidence, all right? And that circumstantial evidence consists of stories like this next one, the Wanjana. Who's heard of the Wanjana? In the Kimberley region of Australia, there was a, uh, a people that believed in the Wanjana. They were uh, beings that came from outer space. They lived under the ocean, and they had mastery of the water. These masters of the water, what does that mean? They actually could manipulate water. And we look at it now and say, well, that's a silly science fiction. Uh, yeah, so was flying faster than the speed of sound. So was human space flight at one point, okay? Not anymore, okay? And the Wanjana were immortalized in these cave pictographs as these creatures that had these large heads, and they had this around their head. They had this weird little halo. I did a whole talk on halos uh, in, in, in Denver uh, because no one else really thought about the fact that the halo is all throughout history. It's shown around all the, the so-called deities throughout history. But wait a minute, why the halo? What would prompt them to do that? And the answer is probably that they saw it. It was something they observed. Maybe it's a germ field from an alien species that came here. Maybe it's a bio screen of some kind. I don't know, I can't tell you. I just know that it exists all throughout the art, throughout all the thousands of years, everywhere. It's an oddest thing. So just store that. We're not going to talk about it anymore, but just keep that in mind. 
The world's a crazy place. So there's an interesting story about the Wanjana and how their mythology uh, progressed. And it started here. There were these two boys that apparently were torturing an owl to death. Rotten kids. I have two of my own. Okay. Well, <laughs> they're better than that, though. They wouldn't torture owls. But in revenge, the, the Wanjana wiped out the aboriginal village, and a lot of their land was destroyed. Now, you have to ask the question, was it really an owl? I mean, owls are definitely screen memories for, you know, for alien creatures. We've seen that in the literature before. And what does that mean? It means that the owl becomes the substitute for what actually occurred possible. I'm a science guy. I can't say that's happened for sure. I just know that the correlation between these two is too close to just dismiss outright. And the Wanjana, having mastery of the water, could have easily destroyed the village. Now you look at it from a science point of view. Well, maybe it was just a tsunami and the myth grew out of that. Yeah, okay, maybe. But it's all the ancillary things that go and, and discuss this myth that surround it that you can't just dismiss. So we have mysteries here. And our planet has its own uh, you know, span of history that we don't even know. You know? Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But we do have these legitimate feelings about why we might be found or have been found. But one thing that we do is we try to find other Earth-like worlds. And, and what does that mean? You know, what is Earth-like? Well, Earth-like means oxygenated atmosphere, like we mentioned. Uh, maybe nitrogen, you know, in the majority. We don't, you know, that's kind of like our, our Earth, right? Uh, a certain size. Whereas size really doesn't, you know, size isn't that important, you know. Uh, we found out that above a certain diameter, a planet can hold an atmosphere. Mars is a lot smaller than the Earth, and it could hold an atmosphere just fine. But something happened to Mars, which is very different than the Earth, okay, that, that caused that atmosphere to thin down to, you know, a fraction of our own. But what does Earth-like mean for what we're searching for? It means that the, 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 the planet that we're searching for is in what's called a habitable zone. It means that there is standing water on the surface, liquid water, and it means that the star is stable. Well, is the star stable? <laughs> no. Not all stars, I mean, we, we see a lot of stars that are not stable, all right? But so a habitable zone is, of course, this. It's the, the, the not too hot, not too cold zone around a star where a planet can support liquid water and have temperatures that aren't boiling or too cold. This is a good thing. <laughs> I think we agree, and I don't like the winter, so it's a very good thing if it's a little more on the warm side, thank you very much, okay? And is that a statement? <laughs> Sorry, that's just funny. <laughs> I think it was hilarious. Good timing, too. You know, oh, you need to talk, might talk a little slow for you? <laughs> I'm kidding. I, mean, I don't mean that. So, and liquid water, of course, is very important. We came from the water. And uh, a, a little fact that you, you might think about is you have a skin. The skin organ developed over, of course, a long, t long period of time. But we used to be waterborne creatures. We used to be in the ocean, and we left the ocean. We transitioned to land at some point during our history. That transition was fraught with peril, of course, because now we're walking on the land, we're crawling on the land, slithering, walking on four little legs, going bipedal at some point. We're walking with just two feet. But we did something crazy, and we didn't do it. It was sort of automatic. Because we needed sodium and salt, right? Sodium and chlorine, salt, sodium chloride. Because we needed that, our bodies evolved this mutation, which ended up being a permanent addition, which is called skin. And that skin holds in a vestigial ocean of salinity. That's why you have salinity. When you lick your forearm and, and, a, and it's, you lick it, it's like, ah, that, that's salty. That's right, because you came from the ocean and that's the leftover. Okay, that's how this works. Our evolutionary track took us that way. And if you got people that don't believe that, tell them, I can prove it to you. And they'll say, how? And say, lick your armpit. <laughs> that's right. You have the last laugh, I promise. <laughs> but, so we need liquid water, all right? We do indeed. Now, 
we also need a stable star. And this brings us to a point of trying to understand what does a stable star mean? And we're going to get to that. Because our sun, uh, as it turns out, you may not realize this, our sun may not be the best star for our planet. But wait, you'll say, we're here. We're alive. Yes. But we also have to worry about skin cancer. We, always have, we have to worry about uh, these other things. We have to worry about gamma rays. We have to worry about uh, radiation from the sun on uh, energetic uh, days when, and when the sun is going through a solar storm. We have to worry about that stuff. There are stars where that doesn't happen. They're stable, like that cricket, okay? That would be perfect for that because it's just like, oh, another boring day on planet B29, you know? Everything's the same, nothing changes, and, and it's just fine. That's the kind of thing. And those planets are called superhabitable planets. Yes, yeah, superhabitable. Now, our sun uh, provides a planet that is number one on the scale because, well, we just said, okay, let's start with Earth and make it number one. Uh, but you know what? There's going to be something that's uh, above that, apparently. So keep in mind that by luck of the draw, we survived here in spite of our sun. And remember that our Earth is very dynamic. In spite of the earthquakes, in spite of the tsunamis, in, sp in spite of the flooding, in spite of the storms, in spite of the tornadoes and everything, we survived in spite of it all. And that's how you want to think about it, okay? Because there's no guarantee that we should have. When we talk about stars, you know, what kind of stars can actually support life? <clears throat> well, there's this pretty diagram. Excuse me, uh, just a little, little word here. I, uh, my right vocal cord's paralyzed. So it sounds like I have a cold all the time, but I have a much deeper voice. It sounds better, okay? I used to have a higher voice, and it would have been a lot more monotonous than this. <laughs> okay, to hear me talking like this all the time, look at those crazy stars. <laughs> Get a paralyzed vocal cord. It'll change everything, you know? But that said, that, I'm just, that's why I cough a little bit, so just a little warning. I feel a little conscious about that. So this diagram here is a diagram that we call the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. That little dot right there in the center, okay, that there is the sun. And you'll see that it's right above the G. Well, we're a, a G-type star. These letters correspond to color, basically, O-B-A-F-G-K-M. Okay, the O's are bright blue, and it goes to white, to uh, yellowish, like the G's, then the orangey, and then red. Now, these go higher mass, that is to say, brighter, much brighter stars, okay? There are stars that if you put them where the sun is, they would go out past the orbit of Jupiter. That's huge. I think the next time I'll do a scale model showing that too. That you'll like, you know? So these stars, we found that everything after about the A, all right, can support planets that might be able to have life forms. Because those previous things, okay, habitable zone, okay, water, stable star, can occur from A on down. However, we've also discovered something crazy. These little M stars down here, these are little percolators. These things, our sun's gonna last about 10 billion years. Those guys are gonna last all that time. Holy cow, look at that go. Um, let me go back then. Uh, you didn't see that. Move along, move along. So, I know, I love buttons. I'm a button pusher. So, what we see is these little M stars down here, okay, these are like percolators that actually percolate away. Our sun's going to go 10 billion years. They're going to go like trillions, trillions of years. So, we've also found that most of the planets in our galaxy are around those types of stars, the red ones. And guess what? There's more of those types of stars than any other type in the galaxy. And when you go out at night in the darkest place on this planet, with beautiful skies, you can't see a single one of those stars with your eye. They're all too faint. But in their own way, they provide a tremendous amount of energy to the planets that surround them. And because they are so small and put out so little energy, the planets have to be really close. And you'll find that these planets are sometimes, it's more like looking at, the, at Jupiter and its moons than the sun and its planets. Okay, case point, TRAPPIST-1. Who's heard of TRAPPIST-1? TRAPPIST-1 
uh, is the uh, name of the uh, uh, unit, the system that actually discovered the star, TRAPPIST-1. But then we found seven planets around this star. Every one of them are closer to its star than Mercury is to the sun. All right? Now, what does that mean? It means that you would think that they would just be boiling and just you know, hot and everything, but actually three of those planets are in the habitable zone for that star. Three! That means that there's three chances there that there might be life of some kind. That's outstanding, right? So we're going to probably focus on TRAPPIST-1 with the James Webb Telescope when we send it up, finally, and it will look at the atmosphere because that's what it's going to be good at. So of all these stars, we think, like I said, that... A through M type stars, those, these are called spectral classes on the bottom, from A through M, so A, you know, A, F, G, K, M. That's where we think we can find habitable worlds. The other stars like these one here, like these, these O type stars, these O giants, they last about 100 million years, 200 million years. Then they explode in a, in a supernova. Now, a supernova is nothing to sneeze at, it's the, one of the largest explosions in the universe. <clears throat> and when that happens, the star is obliterated. Uh, I won't go through the physics, and I'm sure you'll be happy about how that happens, but suffice it to say, it's a very violent outcome, but something happens during that that we'll talk about in a minute. So planets can exist from type A through M. That's good news, right? And there's lots of those in our galaxy, with M's being the most prominent. And here's where we talk about that thing I just told you about. Here's that ugly thing called the periodic table of the elements. Who remembers this? Who wants to forget this? <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, guess what? Now, don't think ill of me, but I can sing the entire periodic table. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but I can sing. And it goes, there's hydrogen and helium and lithium, beryllium, and on. And I can go on and on. Not going to do it. Maybe if I get paid to do it, I'll do it. I mean, maybe at an after party, I'll do it. But the thing is, why am I showing this? Okay, no one wants to see this stupid chart. I get it. But you need to understand that you're made of stuff that was once in the hearts of stars. You're made of the stuff that was forged in the hearts of stars. That, stars, that stuff was released to the interstellar medium. Okay, we call it the ISM, interstellar medium. It was released to the interstellar medium when the star blew up. It went out into the universe. It went out to make uh, planets and other stars. And those stars were formed with a lot of these elements in them. Okay, our sun, indeed, was formed with a lot of these elements in, them, in it. And if you look at what you're made of, you're made of a lot of these. You're made up from, with a lot of the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. You've got other, you've got a, some aluminum. You've got a lot of these phosphorus. You've got chlorine. You've got a sodium. There's magnesium. You, you, who takes magnesium in here, okay? I mean, you need magnesium. You know, well, that's because you get a supplement. You don't have any plutonium, <laughs> a good thing, okay, because a, a, a ten thousandth of a gram could kill a city. <laughs> okay, so it's kind of a dangerous chemical, you know, element. But the thing is, these all come from uh, different processes in the universe. And I'll, I'll just summarize quickly. Obviously, the yellow ones are from these supernovae, where stars finally run out of their fuel to fuse elements into another, and when that happens, a star is always fighting back. It's got this outward radiation pressure, and it's always fighting the, the, the desire to the collapse from its own gravity. So it's a balance. It's pushing out with its radiation, and the gravity's trying to collapse it. Well, that stable balance, we call it hydrostatic equilibrium, that stable balance is what keeps a star in check. Our sun's in hydrostatic equilibrium. Great. <laughs> Good thing. And it's going to be that way for another five billion years. All right, so we're going to be, we're comfortable with that. So high mass stars, when they run out of energy, that outward pressure just stops, just stops. And now gravity collapses the star, but it's going all to the center, so it has nowhere to go. So all those layers, they smash into the core and through a variety of other processes, they actually create additional elements in the periodic table, all right? And that's what we're seeing here by these different colors, all right? We see dying low mass stars. That's the, the green part, all right? This is, believe me, this is a whole college class if you want it, but I'm not going to give that to you either because it's not what you're here for. But the point being, we are made of the elements of the stars that were created in the stars, and this table is extremely important. You don't need to understand it here today. Just be aware, all right? And so... Moving along, uh, 
we want to find planets that would do similar things. We want to find planets made of the same stuff, obviously, because this stuff is spread throughout the interstellar medium. So how do we do this? Well, one way that we do it is with the Kepler Space Telescope. I know you've all heard of the Kepler Space Telescope. Okay. Have you heard of the K2? What's K2? You, got, can you, you, you don't have to tell me. But you know what it is, right? Some of you. Yeah. See, when Kepler, Kepler actually had a problem. And I was working on a satellite project for a, a contractor, a defense contractor. Uh, and I was told it was a, you know, a secret satellite project and all that. And I, I've done, I do that kind of work for uh, the Navy a lot. And, and but, but I know that you know, when you look at a satellite, obviously you know, sometimes they borrow the technology and capability to do other tasks with a satellite. And so the DOD might use it for something. And then you know, uh, climatologists will use it to study the atmosphere or whatever. It depends on the capabilities of the satellite. Well, the Kepler Space Telescope was put up there to examine the area around stars and look for the planetary evidence that there were you know, other bodies going around these stars. Now, it was launched in 2009, and it has this curved image sensor here. You see it's got a curve. It's not the screen. It's actually curved. And that's the back side of the sensor. And the reason it's curved uh, has to do with, for those that are interested, is Petzval radius curvature. It's, a, it's actually a... Uh, a curvature that occurs because light doesn't all focus at the same place when it's coming through a lens. So you have to curve the sensor to receive the light in the same place everywhere. You, know, you can kind of intellectually see how that would be a thing. And it is a thing, and so uh, Kepler took care of that. Um, now, Kepler has uh, a number of items on it, including these reaction wheels. All right? uh, when you see a reaction wheel, it, th these are these reaction wheels. They're, they're little discs. I actually have a close-up of those to show you. I took this picture out in Arizona, uh, and uh, this is a cleared photo. I had a number of photos I couldn't show anybody, uh, but I got this one to show, and I'm a, there's a story to that, which I'll tell you in a minute. But these guys replace the need for retro rockets. Remember that? Who remembers retro rockets? Little jets that would fire little things to stabilize a rocket, right? No more. These are spinning weights. They're just spinning. They'll, they don't spin them all the time. They, they'll spin this weight up, and because they're on an angle, and there's four of them, all right, because they're on an angle, like that angle, if you spin them in the right combination, you can kind of see how you can actually direct the satellite to turn in any orientation. And that's how they steer the Kepler around. And that force that, that these spinning wheels put on the satellite is called a torque. All right, a torque. And that's what happens here. So in the Kepler, um, there were four of them, and it could work with three, but it lost two. And now it could no longer be pointed with accuracy. So the Kepler mission was officially concluded. They said, all right, I guess we're not going to be able to use Kepler anymore. And then this really smart engineer decided, well, wait a minute. The sun's radiation pressure, like the stars I was telling you about, the radiation pressure of the sun is pressing on the Kepler telescope too. So if we reprogram the two working wheels, can't we just use all three of that, the, the radiation pressure from the sun that's constant, and the two wheels to actually steer the Kepler? Yes, we can. You're a genius. And Kepler became K2. And so now that's called the extended mission for Kepler. A little tidbit, you know, trivia. If you're playing Trivial Pursuit, you'll know the answer, OK, if they're asked. So it's really cool. And I have to tell you, I, I took this, this is a photo uh, of me in this monkey suit, this bunny suit. And the reason that I took the photo wasn't to say, look at me, I can wear a silly suit. It wasn't that at all. I was trying to show the special garb is not optional. Most importantly, this little cable that you see right there, this black little cable going down, that goes down to a little hanging plug. And that little plug has to get plugged into a metal bar before you get within three feet of the satellite. The reason is to drain the charge. I'm sure some of you are even saying that, to drain all the electrical charge off your body. Because if you get too close to this $450 million satellite, uh, you could actually blow out a $20 million part just by touching it. See, it's really controlled and it's very, very carefully you know, crafted. You gotta remember, these things work out in space. So to work in space, we have to create them in an atmosphere here on Earth. So there's a lot of considerations there. So that's what happens. And I watched the guy get fired because he didn't plug in and he had dropped something and he leaned over like this to pick it up. The satellite was right here. And he leaned over to pick it up and then backed away very carefully. 
He was fired on the spot. And I said to the guy running the program, I said, that's pretty harsh, man. And he goes, not as harsh as it would have been if our client had a blowout due to that negligence. And I went, okay, I'll just stay over here. I'll stay out of this one. And so I was very careful to plug in, trust me. So it's not optional. You got you to gotta really suit up. So I worked on that. And, and, and so Kepler was rejuvenated as K2 by that. And it could have been that somebody got a little too close to the Kepler way back when. And that caused a fault down the line that caused Kepler to fail. And it cost several million dollars to do this re-engineering, but they did it. The end result is, how does it actually work? Well, as you can see, and as some of you know, a star between, you know, that's, that's far away, that has a planet going around it, or say planets, as the planet enters the star's uh, face, as seen from here, the light from the star is going to dim a little bit, like you see down there. Okay? That's called a light curve. And that light curve is very important because it tells us a lot of things. We can calculate how big the planet is, how far away from the star it is, what the mass of the planet may be, and what the mass of the star may be. And this can help us figure out a lot of parameters. And we have found, uh, right now to date, we're just almost at 4,000 planets around other stars in a space the size of your clenched fist at arm's length overhead at sunset right now, actually. When it's sunset now and you just do this overhead, you're going to be making a fist at the constellation of Cygnus, which is where this uh, Kepler mission is focused. And we found about, just about 4,000 planets that are out there. Uh, and of those, a certain uh, significant fraction could be Earth-like. And so by extrapolating uh, about the possibilities, you'll see later that that's a very strong possibility that we're going to have a, a, uh, a goodly number of planets that might be Earth-like. And so in Cygnus, it's this little plot that shows you the, uh, the actual layout of the, uh, uh, the uh, sky that the Kepler Space Telescope was looking at in Cygnus. It's, again, it's a fist-shaped area in the sky overhead at night right now. Current, right, right, right now is a good time of year for it because it's looking right at the spot where, Cygnus, where it's located. So um, that uh, number is 2,000 exoplanets, but there's a lot of other candidates in there, just so you know. Um, and there's other methods to find them we have something called radial velocity. Remember when a train goes by? Right, the pitch changes, right? Well, that's sound. Well, light does the same thing. When light's coming towards you, it changes color. It goes toward the blue end of the spectrum. And then when it goes away from you, it gets longer. That's more toward the red end of the spectrum. That's called Doppler shift, and that's, it works with light, too, just like it works with sound. Obviously different. There's no pitch to light, but there is color, right? So we look for a, a star who is exhibiting a change in its Doppler shift. We see the, the, the spectrum of the star, and it tells us information about the star. We can see that information is shifting you know, from time to time as the star is orbiting something that we can't see. Well, that something we can't see might be a planet, and we can figure it out just by looking at the shift that we see, okay? So, um, we also can do direct imaging, and direct imaging is where we actually block the star's light with this, what's well, called an occulting disk, and then we can actually look for the actual objects that might be around the star. In this case, we see that there's several, okay? We've got a number of them out here and out there and out there. This is the first image, first image of another star system ever taken. All right, I got permission to use it from the Keck uh, Gemini Telescope team out at Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And it's now, it's, throughout, you know, it's all throughout the internet, you can find it. But this planet right here, which is at the edge of the occulting disk, this planet is as far away from the star as Neptune is from Mars. So you can see that there might be a whole lot of planets in here that we don't see yet. See? So we could be looking at a, a, a burgeoning new solar system for all we know. Now, uh, there's another way to find stars, and you look at their wobble, the way they move. So if you track a star's motion over time, it might be you know, moving in the sky. And that wobble is going to vary depending on what's tugging on it. And if it has a whole retinue of planets around it, what's well, going to tug on it differently? And you'll see it making these really odd gyrations. And we can calculate what those gyrations are caused by and figure out roughly what they might be. And that's how we find other planets as well. You know, so 
Uh, and the last one that is kind of interesting is gravitational microlensing. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but yeah. So what happens is if there's a star in the distance and a star closer to us that has a planet around it, as the planet goes around its star, it might pass close to this other star way far away, just visually along the line of sight. If it does, the light from that distant star is disturbed and disrupted by the planet that's farther, you know, much closer to us, all right? And that creates a weird image of that star at certain times. If we see that happen over and over and over, we know that it's a planet circling that other star over here because it's making this image change over time in a constant weird way. And that's, uh, that's microlensing. Now, if you're interested in planets, you can go online to look at the Open Exoplanet Catalog, all right, uh, which is a really interesting uh, online catalog of all the planets we've found to date. Um, and if you have an iPhone, you can actually go get Hano Rain's application called Exoplanet. I've talked to Hano, he's a great guy, and he's, he's keeping this up, and he bases it on the online catalog, so it's always updated. And you can see all the latest and greatest uh, you know, planets that have been found. Here you see the Trappist planets I mentioned earlier. All right? And I think that's a really uh, a good way. Uh, it's a good way to actually keep on top of the exoplanet world. Now, when we talk about what we're finding for exoplanets, get an idea here. As of January 2015, okay, we had all these planets found that were, are in blue. Okay. But then as of July, we added a whole bunch more, all right? And you'll notice Earth down here. Notice that the number of Earth-like planets that we're finding has increased markedly. This is a massive increase. I don't, you know, the graphs don't really tell us all that much, you know, but I want you to take away from this that we're looking at uh, a fact that there's more planets that are Earth-like than we ever thought there were. And that's changed a lot of the estimates about how many are out there. Very, very, very cool because that means a great deal for us doing what we do. Now, um, the Spitzer Space Telescope is what has been giving us a lot of information about these, these planets so far uh, besides the Kepler. And the Spitzer Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. It looks for the heat coming from these areas, these planets. And the, the Spitzer, okay, looks at the atmospheres by using this infrared, and it has a mirror that's only just about three feet in diameter, so it's not very large. But the James Webb, on the other hand, which is going to go up now, I guess, in 2021, okay, that number's been going up like an index, you know, for the last five or six times I've been doing this. Um, this one has a mirror that is 21 feet in diameter, and it promises to show us a huge, huge amount of uh, planetary atmospheres. Why is that important? I told you uh, uh, an oxygen atmosphere doesn't want to stay there. An oxygen atmosphere is going to uh, you know, go into the crust of the planet because oxygen is a, is, is a very, very, uh, well, very dynamic element, right? I mean, it wants to go into the crust. It wants to bond with things, form other compounds. You know, Mars did it, like I said, so you get iron oxide, which is FeO2, you know, iron and an oxygen pair. That's, that's really important stuff. So we want to find out more about these atmospheres. And this, this guy right here, this James Webb is probably going to be the one that shows us uh, the next Earth. It's going to find the next Earth for us. And it's going up possibly next year. I mean, that's really cool. That means that all of us in this room are going to get to see the results of this in a short order. I already know there's a short list of planetary candidates they're going to be looking at. And I can't wait. Who's heard of Tabby Star? Remember Tabby Star? Tabby Star, Tabitha Boyajian is an astronomer who actually found a star that seems to have this inexplicable dimming that it's going through. Um, and it's been dimming for over 100 years. And they can't tell why. It doesn't seem to be a natural process. They're trying to pigeonhole, you know, was it a swarm of comets? No. Asteroid belt? No. No. Oh, dust cloud? Eh, it doesn't make sense. The things that are are on the table include all of those things, but then there's one more, and that is the possibility that Tabby Star is dimming because an alien civilization is building a gigantic, what they call a megastructure, uh, a Dyson sphere. That is, they're, they're, they're getting the energy from their star by putting up satellites that are sucking the energy off their planet, uh, I'm sorry, off their star, and beaming it to their planet for their use. 
that's the thing when you go interstellar, when you want to travel between the stars, the thing you need most is energy. You need the energy. So that would do it. So even Tabitha Boyajian, another astronomer, she is totally um, on board with the fact that it's possible that it might be an alien civilization. She's not saying it is, she's saying it's possible. I think that shows that even modern science is starting to accept the possibility that we all here feel we understand, and that is that we have uh, other civilizations in our galaxy um, and the universe. So you've had time to digest this, uh, this, this, this right here. This is a, a, a moderate estimate. It's not conservative, it's not overly ambitious. 25 million to 20 billion Earth-like planets just in our galaxy, based on everything we're seeing with Kepler and the other finds. Kepler's not the only out, uh, program out there. There's many other planetary you know, hunting programs out there, right? But this, is the, this one is really uh, incredible. Now, you have to understand that in the universe, uh, there's many ways in which life will develop and maybe develop and maybe not develop. So we're 4.6 billion years old, our Earth. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. Do the math. It's been here, the universe has been here for over 9 billion years before we even got started. We found a planet out there that's over 12 billion years old. A planet, not a star, a planet. What's that mean? It means that we found a planet that was here from just shortly after the time when the universe formed. Why was that crucial? Because it shows us that planets formed literally within a billion years or so of the birth of the universe. That's important because now that tells us, well, if they started forming back then, it's not just one, there's going to be millions and billions of planets that formed back then. That's important. That tells us that now, all throughout the time that the universe has been here, even before we even showed up, even before the sun became the sun, when there was still just a nebular cloud of gas, that maybe civilizations were on the rise in our universe. Maybe the, some have come and gone, maybe some accelerated to high peaks and have, have since taken over, gone beyond the galaxies, who knows? We see technology to even do that, believe it or not. So we're, we actually see that in our small existence. Now, to get an idea what our existence is, I go back to 5,000 years ago, uh, Sumerian cuneiform uh, language was created. It's at, at, at its tablature, you know, the picked out tablet uh, covers. But that's actually history keeping, you know, proper history keeping. That's, we go back about 5,000 years to get to proper history keeping. If we look at that and go back to that time and come forward 5,000 years to the present day, in that time, we see that we can probably go interstellar. Nice. Thank you. That's perfect. We can go interstellar. The reason is because we have an um, understanding now of physics that takes us to the point where we might be able to see being able to do what's called warp space. Well, wait a minute, Mark. You're talking about Star Trek? Well, not really. But yes, okay, and, but in a real sense. Science fiction often becomes science fact. And I don't think the brain can create anything in its mind that is patently impossible to do. So when Gene Roddenberry came up with warp drive, uh, he wasn't stupid. He actually read stuff about potential for warp drive, and he stumbled upon things that talked about the potential for curving space. Whoa, curving space. I'm sure he didn't understand that, but it's okay. Most people don't, all right? But the fact is, if we can curve space, then we can basically like fold two opposite corners of paper up together till the points almost touch, step across a tiny little gap, unfold it, and we've just gone, say, from here to Alpha Centauri in just a few minutes. What? You can do that? Well, no, because we don't have the energy to create that fold. Okay, and when Miguel Alcubierre in 1994 came up with an idea to do that, he postulated that it was going to take the energy of converting the equivalent of Jupiter to energy, the biggest planet in our solar system, right? That's huge. So it was, as I say, stupendously, colossally impossible to do. So they put it on the shelf and they say, hey, Miguel, cool idea. <laughs> yeah, okay, put that on the shelf, get back to work, All right? So 
it turns out then that a few years later, Sonny White from NASA got a hold of the Alcubierre design, and he teamed up with a guy named Froning, and they created a, a concept called the Froning Alcubierre drive. And by redesigning Miguel Alcubierre's design of his warp drive ship, guess what they discovered? They discovered that they could reduce the amount of energy by 10 to the 26 power that was required to actually make this warp drive work. What does that mean in real terms? It means that instead of having to convert the planet Jupiter to energy, we only had to convert a mass the size of the Voyager spacecraft to energy. Aha! Now it was plausible. Distantly plausible, but still plausible. So NASA has a funded lab. You're actually paying to see warp drive get developed. Isn't that cool? I mean, in a sense, that's, that's a really interesting thing because that means that somebody somewhere knows this is possible. And it won't be a matter of time. It's only 5,000 years into our history. We're actually seeing this now. So we're actually on the cusp. But you have to look at the development of life on our planet. What happens? Life develops on our planet uh, in, in a certain set of ways. We've had major extinction events here, five two of which were probably uh, you know, reductions in biodiversity, you know, the variations in animals stopped for some reason, volcanic eruptions or whatever. But then we had impacts that, that changed the course of life. The Permian extinction over 250 million years ago, that basically caused mammals to go into retreat, and reptiles were able to rise out of that. And they lasted through the age of the dinosaurs into the Jurassic. After that, when the Jurassic extinction came, well, the, you know, the, they call it the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction 65 million years ago. When that happened, mammals once again could rise out of the darkness and come back to the forefront, which is where we are now. So if we look at what might have happened had none of that happened, okay, what does that mean? I mean, you think about it, the possibilities are endless. So we don't, you know, we're only getting started here. That's, that's what that means, all right? Now, what does it mean for that to occur, for, for life to develop? You know, we only know one planet that has had that happen, and that was us, you know? And to understand how uh, a planet might uh, develop, uh, what I'd like to do is to take you through a little exercise that I've created. Uh, I'm using a very high-tech piece of apparatus, so you gotta bear with me, and you gotta be really careful when you handle it, okay? Because you're gonna get a chance. And it's this uh, roll of toilet paper. <laughs> That's right. Toilet paper, it's clean. Well, no, I've used this before, uh, but it's clean that way, all right? So um, it's gonna be a little tricky because I, I don't have a, a wireless, so I'm gonna try and do what I did for another lecture. Let's see if this works. Okay, this will probably be at best. Uh, oh, if you don't mind, you sure? Okay, so what, what this means is um, we're going to try and show you that this, this roll of toilet paper is going to serve to illustrate for us a number of things. First thing it's going to illustrate is that toilet paper doesn't have to ever get used. <laughs> okay? Is this going to illustrate for us that we have a history here on the planet Earth? And we want to know how this history occurred. So how are we going to do that? Well, I put the entire history of the Earth on a roll of toilet paper. From the time the Earth formed, which is right here, and that's at sheet 298 all the way to us in this room today. That's right, you're in here, you're in here, yeah. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna start unrolling this and I'm gonna talk about what we find along the way because there's a lot of developments that the Earth had happen that make a difference for, and, and actually made it possible for you to be here. And I think it's kinda cool to see it. You know, so if I could, could I ask you to be the Earth forming? Thanks, man. You're, you're all quite cool. Come over here so I can... There you are. Thank you, by the way. Okay, so now at sheet 298, the Earth forms. But then as we move along, all of a sudden... I know it's going to be hard. Let me just, uh, just do it this way. Let's come over there. Sure. And I'll just go like here. Oh, perfect. All right? And we'll try that. Then I'm going to run right into you. So. <laughs> then over here, at, uh, at this sheet here, which is... Now I can't read the sheet. Okay, the formation of the moon. And that was around 4.5 billion years ago. All right? So that's, that's what we're getting. It's about uh, 15 million years uh, per, per sheet here, okay? And now we keep going. And now over here, I'm going to do this again like this. Over here at sheet 284, we have the oldest earth rocks ever found, the oldest earth rocks at sheet 284, okay? And that was around 4.4 billion years ago, all right? 
And those happened to be like little zircons that were found. And uh, that was sort of a key finding because there have been people that said the Earth is not really 4.6 billion years old. Well, it's at least 4.4. <laughs> okay? So moving along, we come along here. And as we come here, now we get to this plot, this spot. And this is now sheet 300, uh, sorry, 272. 4.2 billion, billion years ago, volcanic outgassing started forming an atmosphere. Our planet has enough gravity, enough mass to retain an atmosphere. So as these volcanoes erupted, gases accumulated on the planet's surface. They didn't go away, all right? They didn't go out into space. They stayed attached to our planet because of its gravity, all right? That's important, too, because this shows that all the way back here, our atmosphere was forming. It was fully toxic, no oxygen, all right? Actually, it was uh, a lot of uh, methane. There was a hydrogen sulfide, all right? And, and, and especially hydrogen sulfide, okay? And, and carbon dioxide from volcanic eruptions, all right? But it continues. And as we move down here, let's move back into the pole. <laughs> uh, I'll go around the pole because that actually serves as a little bit of a, a backstop for me. That's, that's a person holding that instead. So as we come along now, we keep going, and we're, we're moving through the ages here at 15 million years a clip. And by the way, uh, I did use a real roll of toilet paper in the beginning, and you can imagine it got pretty ratty. So after three times, that was it, it was done. So I went and I made this roll out of a heavier paper. I drew every single line for 117 feet, and I, I did it. I don't have a life. <laughs> yeah. But hey, you do, and you get to hear about it. This is cool. So now if I, uh, let's move over here. Let's get on this side for a second. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So right here, you'll notice that this one here says early bacteria and algae. This is when the cyanobacteria this is when the cyanobacteria arose. Cyanobacteria are very important because cyanobacteria are the carbon dioxide gobblers. These things ate the carbon dioxide and they, they, their waste product was oxygen. So be thankful that you have these bacteria because you're breathing because of your breathing bacteria poop. Hey, that's science, I'm sorry. <laughs> Now back here uh, where these cyanobacteria occurred, you'll notice I don't have a, 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 an age on this. And the reason is because there's debate. Was it 3.2 billion years? Was it 3.8? 3.2, 3. There's dispute. So and you know what? While they figure out when it actually happened, I know that it happened. You know that it happened. It happened around here. Good enough. We don't need to be specific today. But I'll, I promise you I will fix that when we finally have a definitive answer. I will go with my no life and I'll go into my shop and I will take this and unroll it again on my little special thing I made and I will put 3.2 billion years. Uh-huh. And then I'm done. <laughs> you know, so, so then now, keep in mind, that's where it's happening, way over here, all right? So we keep going. Go on here. We're going to keep going. All right, I'm just going to keep going a little longer here. There we are. And now something else happened. What's that? Well, let's see. This at sheet 174, well, no surprise. The buildup of the oxygen atmosphere, as expected. All right. Now, we had a lot higher oxygen content in this planet. Our oxygen was as high as 33%. Did you know that? It was. That would, that would actually burn our lungs today. If we breathe that right now, it would, it would be very, very difficult for us. It would be painful. Thank you for holding that. And this was 2.7 billion years ago. We're still in the billions, okay? So we'll keep going. And I'm gonna come around here and then stop because we got something happening. And over here, 2.5 billion years ago, this is the Proterozoic era. This is where the earliest of life that we can possibly have seen shows up, all right? 2.5 billion years ago. So something's happening on this planet. But look how much time it's taking for the littlest things to be occurring, you know? It takes a lot of time for the oxygen atmosphere to build up. And then as, it comes, as we come across, we keep going. All right, I'm gonna go around. As we come around now, we come down and you'll see that we're getting smaller, but look at a whole lot of nothing's going on. It sounds like a song, you know? But it's like a whole lot of nothing's happening, apparently. But that's not what's really happening. There's a lot going on right now. The planet is still percolating. The planet is still creating oxygen. There's creatures that are still gobbling carbon dioxide. The atmosphere is still thicker than it should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. 
And so it's very important to understand that as this happened, you know, our oxygen, our atmosphere, everything on the planet is changing dynamically right now in, at this point. We are gaining oxygen. We're losing carbon dioxide. We're, the, the rock compounds are changing. The ocean waters are changing. Life in the ocean is changing and accelerating. Um, and then we get down here and we see that something else has happened. Well, let's see what that is. Okay? And this is uh, 1.4 billion years ago. We're still in the billions. Okay, 1.4 billion years ago. This is where the first early supercontinent, Rodinia, happened. It was over here. Okay? Look at all this. This was all, you know, no, no land masses yet. This is where the first supercontinent basically uh, yeah, kind of uh, amassed, I would say. So it was mostly a, sort of an ocean planet. You know, it was a magma planet that cured, that, that cooled. And then we had uh, a lot of rain that occurred, which brought a lot of water. Um, and, and the water became, uh, the, the sodium ions in the, in the rock strata washed away easily. And so did the chlorine atoms, that just happens to be the case. Therefore, on any planet where it rains onto rock strata, you're going to get salty oceans because the sodium and the chloride form a weak bond in the water known as salt, right? And so that is how come we have a salty ocean, all right? And I think maybe I'll go up this way because that might make it a little easier. So as we keep going, can I hold that coin? He's going to be the supercontinent. Thank you so much. As we leave our supercontinent behind, um, we keep going. Now with something else is happening. This is one point. Uh, two billion years ago, the first known animals are here. All right. And now we keep going. Isn't this fun? I, I, I get the toilet paper, my audience, man. I, I, this is great it's like, stuff. It's like Blue Man Group. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's Blue Man Group on science. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I was influenced by them because when, when I was in college, I was taking drum lessons. By, from Chris Wink, who went on to found Blue Man Group. Oh, he was the lead, he was the guy that found Blue Man Group. Everything comes full circle. Everything comes full circle, that's right. So this is now sheet 51, all right? And this is 800 million years ago. Thankfully, we're in the millions now. <laughs> 800 million years ago, the breakup of the early supercontinent. Oh, well, you know, hey, we tried to get along, we couldn't, we broke up, okay? The, the supercontinent broke apart at this point. That's when we started, now what's that saying? That's saying that tectonic plates began to manifest themselves. We started to see plates forming that broke the supercontinent apart. When it's one giant continent, all right, on this large ocean planet, well, that's one ecosystem, basically. And when it breaks apart and starts drifting all over the, all over the world, that changes the dynamics of what goes on on the planet. That changes the climates in which they're in, because we're at a tilt in our, our orbit. So we actually have seasons all right, if we were like this, we wouldn't, you know, but we are like this. So that changes things. So the, the breakup of the early supercontinent actually provided us with an opportunity to really change and get a diversity in the life that then formed, all right? I'm going to turn around and come this way. So as, I, as, we kill, as we go on now, then we get to this. This is 100, uh, so 700 million years ago, all right? And this is uh, sheet 45. If you want to tally 45 times 15 billion, I'll go through it, 15 million. Uh, this is early multicellular organism. Wow. You see how long it takes? Now, anywhere along the line, if we were explorers looking around through the universe and we encountered another world, um, they could be anywhere on this, on this timeline. Anywhere. They could be here at multicellular organisms. And we'd think, oh, look, nothing here but primitive life. Yet there's a whole evolution left of them that we might disturb if we were to go there. And let's see what that could mean. I mean, clearly, there's a lot of possibilities. And I'm gonna, something else you'll notice, as we get near the end here, you'll notice that it's accelerating. Life is accelerating. We're seeing things happen faster. That's an exponential change in the way life developed here. This is something that I think is very important, and, and because I think that this means that this is not just happening here. This has got to be happening elsewhere as well. All right, and I don't know that, you know, again, intelligence is not a foregone conclusion. It's a journey. We got there through a circuitous means of extinction events to look like we do. 
these frail beings carrying a little ocean around with us on our turtle backs, okay? But it might be different elsewhere. Other beings might not have that same problem. They might not have gone extinct. So when people say, I think there's reptilians out there, well, what if we didn't have the, the Cretaceous paleogene, you know, 65 million year ago you know, extinction event with the dinosaurs? What if we didn't have that? Could dinosaurs have evolved intelligence? Well, <laughs> we don't know. But we do know that there were theropods at that time, meat eaters, they were actually developing radically bigger crank cases as brain capacity at that time. So they were changing their intelligence little by little. So something was going on, but then they were just destroyed. So something was happening, and we don't know what. So maybe people, when they say, oh, there might be reptilians, who knows, but they might not be wrong. But we don't know, because that, that whole lifeline was ended. All right? Of course, birds now are the, the, the remaining uh, relatives that are left behind, you know. And they might have had feathers, like dinosaurs, you know, have feathers, or had feathers, that's possible. Now, uh, here on sheet 35, uh, this is the Precambrian era, all right? This is, of course, at a time when it was 544 million years ago. This is when uh, the oceans were starting to populate with other life forms. In other words, diversity, biodiversity was occurring on a rapid scale, all right? That's why we call it out for the Cambrian. And there were early shelled creatures back here, trilobites. Who's familiar with trilobites? Yeah, I've got, I've got a number of fossils of trilobites, which are just awesome, okay? Scary looking creatures. I wouldn't want to encounter one of these little things, you know, like, uh, you know? But it's probably like a horseshoe crab. The horseshoe crab's a living fossil. It hasn't changed much, you know? And so, um, so the Cambrian area begins right here at sheet 34. And the Cambrian era ends here at sheet 32. Now, when I say ends, what does that mean? Beginning and end of these eras is punctuated by changes in the earth or the environment such that we can make a definitive uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding and get a definitive uh, location or a locator value for it. So here, uh, the Ordovician era begins, and that was 510 million years ago. And now, fish arose 490 million years ago. All right, so now we see the onset of fish. Okay, first time. Look how long it took. All right, just fish. You know, so you want trout, you got to wait. You know, several billion years. Now, uh, 450 million years ago, here's a very important place right here. This is a very important place, and it's sheet 29 out of uh, 298. 450 million years ago, early plants on the land. Land plants. Transition from water plants to land plants. This was important because now we're talking about um, the ability for land plants to develop the techniques they use to procreate. All right, and that did happen, as we'll see. So this was something that happened, uh, like I said, 450 million years ago. Now, the Ordovician uh, era ended 440 million years ago, and it ended by uh, something we call the Ordovician extinction. And at that point, uh, it's like, uh, as I say, 56, no, 86. 86% 86 of the species on the Earth died at the Ordovician era extinction. Now, the Permian era is coming up, and that's actually, uh, you'll see in a minute. But the, uh, the Permian era, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Ordovician era um, ended there with that extinction. And then the Silurian era began, and that's 408 million years ago, all right? And during that era, we saw, uh, uh, thank you we saw uh, some very large insects, the largest insects ever. We also had the largest uh, oxygen content on the planet. Again, 33%. So dragonflies, no lie, had 28-inch wingspans. Dragonflies, you know, the little things that big. 28 inches. Now, if that just comes, you don't swat it. He grabs you. Ah! <laughs> Bye, Torg. Got, you know, dragonfly got Torg, you know. So, I mean, that could happen, you know, but no longer do we have these large insects, you know. But again, large oxygen content meant animals could grow bigger. That's why dinosaurs were so large, you know. That's the truth of that. So, that's 400 million years ago. Now, uh, there was also, uh, on sheet 22 here, okay, we go from the Silurian into the Devonian, 
and that's where the insects occurred. And in the Devonian era had another extinction where 75%, 75% of the species uh, apparently died out. But this is one of those biodiversity failures. They just stopped varying for some reason. And there's a possibility that at this point, uh, back, uh, uh, volcanoes in the region of Siberia were erupting and they were putting a lot of hydrogen sulfide into the oceans and uh, a number of other chemicals. And that stuff tended to bond with oxygen in a way that made the oxygen reduce in the oceans. And so life was having a harder time to surviving, so the diversity of the life forms started to drop. And that's right there. So that's an extinction event, and it was 75% of the species actually died you know, at that point. Now, 340 million years ago was another uh, interesting transition because that was the first reptiles. See, with every extinction, okay, life is destroyed, but it creates an opportunity. And this was the opportunity for the first reptiles to come out 340 million years ago. And that's what happened. Now, um, at 280 million years ago, here on sheet uh, 18, all right, 280 million years ago, this is when Pangaea was formed. Remember Pangaea? You know, we know about Pangaea. Did you know about Rodinia? See, we had Rodinia and now we have Pangaea, okay? Well, Pangaea formed 280 million years ago. And then here on sheet 15, we have the unbelievable Permian extinction. This is when, uh, and this was you know, 245 million years ago, minimally, okay? And this was when 96% of all the life on the planet died. 96%. Important extinction, though. Why? Because when this happened, this gave the reptiles, which started showing up over there, if you recall, another edge. And the mammals were forced into hiding, and now the reptiles started coming out in force. And this is the basically started the age of the reptiles, effectively, when they could come out. Now, um, this is when the Triassic era also begins. We talk about the Permian and Triassic border as being that Permian extinction. And this was 300, I'm sorry, 245 million years ago. Now, there was also uh, where the Triassic ends, okay, well, which is uh, 208 million years ago, 80% of the species died in another extinction event. All right? And this is the beginning of the Jurassic era. Now, it was only 80%, uh, so it didn't take out enough so that the uh, uh, large creatures like dinosaurs couldn't roam the earth. They're still coming, don't worry, all right? Uh, but look, we don't have much left, do we? That's pretty amazing. So now we come down, and this is uh, sheet 12 now. Here, this is uh, about 200 million years ago. This is the first time we ever knew there was an, or, or found an Atlantic Ocean, because this is where the Atlantic Ocean opened up. Plate tectonics, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge spreading and, and ripping Africa and Europe away from the North America and South America, ripping it away. And this is where it happened, right? It happened here. Now, 180 million years ago, uh, this is where we finally had early birds and mammals. Because this was something that uh, was an important development because they're land creatures, okay? Now, another thing, uh, my, uh, oh, well, you're right, thank you. And then here, uh, 150 million years ago, early flowering plants. This is where pollination begins. This was 150 million years ago. That bred new species of flowers. It created cross-pollinated strains. It created new insects that took advantage of this new opportunity in this ecosystem. And that's exactly what this was. So that's why that was a very important de de development. And that was 150 million years ago. I actually have a piece of amber, all right? And um, it's very old, uh, probably about 100 million years old, actually, when they, and they aged it. And I have a bee in it, okay? It's called an insect amber. And under my microscope, I could actually see every little detail of this bee trapped forever in this amber. What's amber? It's sap that's hardened, right? And this is, it's beautiful. I mean, it just, it wrenches at me because it's like, wow, this little life form, you know, died so long ago at the hands of a stupid sap, you know, and it's a cycle, but boy, it's incredible, you know. Now, uh, at 80 million years ago, this is where the Rocky Mountains began to form because of the pressure from the North Atlantic plate, or North American plate 
pressing against the Pacific plate. It kind of, and it crushed those mountains together. Um, and uh, you'll see another one here soon. Um, now, uh, just 40 million years ago now, of course, the tectonics are really starting to act up now and starting to create uh, a lot of new features. This is where India collides with Asia. And if you look at the ocean floor maps, you can see the skid marks from India hitting Asia, right? You look, you see the trail left behind of that, 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 that debris left behind. I think that's really, really cool. Because uh, it's telling you how the world formed right there. You know, that plate. Now, if you look at, uh, if, uh, look at, we're at the end. Whew. Can I ask you to hold that for one second? Thanks. Thank you very much. I know you're saying, thankfully, he's over. <laughs> we get to the end here, okay. Now, um, we're looking at, at the same place that India collides with Asia. This is when we started getting global cooling and glaciation. Global cooling. Yeah. And um, 23 million years ago, it was a tertiary, a tertiary period. And um, this is uh, also uh, where, and I, I left one thing out, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, this is also where um, we had the first ice at the poles. We never had ice at the North and South Pole until uh, 25 million years ago. Isn't that odd? Okay. Now, I... I I kind of went by it uh, kind of on purpose because I wanted to come back to it because um, I got to point something out. Back here, uh, back on sheet four, <laughs> all right, we were on sheet two just now. So let's jump back 30 million more years. And we go back, and now we see that uh, back here at sheet four, there's another thing that happened. This was the Cretaceous Paleogene event. This is when an asteroid struck our planet 65 million years ago. Now, it didn't kill all the dinosaurs just like that. That's sort of a, a common misconception. It took many years for the dinosaurs to die out because the meat eaters, they went first when the plant eaters died, okay, and started dying off. And the meat eaters were dependent on a lot of calorie intake, and those were gone fast. Um, the, oceanographic, uh, the oceanographics, uh, oceanographic world changed dramatically because when that asteroid hit, a pall of dust was thrown up in the air and plankton couldn't do their job as efficiently. And that changed levels all over the world, you know, of the atmospheric content. And over time, it took a lot of time for the dinosaurs to actually die off. And when they did, who rose from the ashes, again, were the mammals. The mammals that went into retreat when the Permian occurred, okay, had to, are now made a, a whole again and are able to come out of hiding to make all of you. And it took that extinction for that to happen. Who knows how it would have been and what it would have looked like had it not occurred at that, at that point in time. I'm telling you, the history is fascinating on this planet, and it's like, I can't get enough of it, and I'm sure you can, so I'm gonna try and wrap it up as soon as I can. But, I know. So, and the other thing too, just to give you an idea, uh, right, this line right here, this is just my, my hold area, so I can hold it, but this is the actual end line, all right? I know you can't really see that that well, but I wanna show you. The end line is this, uh, this line right here, and just to the right of it, one fourth of an inch away, is Lucy 4.4 million years ago. A little eye-opening, isn't it? How many people thought Lucy's a lot farther down the path? Why, but right here? Well, get this. Let's, let's, go back to this. let's go back to the dinosaur extinction. This is when dinosaurs died, and this is us in the room today. Dinosaurs were 18 inches ago. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Now imagine that all along this line, all along this time frame, we're looking for planets with life out there, life like us. What are the chances we're going to find this little tiny time slice of a civilization out there? Probably not very good in the short run, but the fact is they exist. They're there. And why? Well, because statistically we see that there's a lot of planets like ours out there. So. I want you to just have this, to, I'm going to show you this and let this serve to remind you of the amazing history of our planet. And you'll never forget it because it was shown to you, shown to you on, a, on a roll of toilet paper. So thank you guys for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this.